Hey everybody! Welcome to the Richelieu voice chat. Welcome to the uh, Building Worlds Backwards presentation. Um, it's great to have you all here. Like I said in uh, voice just a second ago, I haven't given a PowerPoint since 8th grade. Hopefully there will be fewer slide transitions and unnecessary midis in this one. Um, okay. So this is a presentation about world building for artists, writers, game devs, comic creators, basically anybody who wants to make a story with a secondary world in it. So fantasy, sci-fi, horror with secondary world elements, you name it. Now, world building is important, but it can be intimidating because the world can be as much a character as your protagonists or your antagonists. If you've done it right, people will want to go back to your um, created world again and again and again. Like Hogwarts, Middle Earth, Narnia, even if you hate everything the author is standing for, you, you can want to go back to Narnia because it, it feels like home. It's a, it's a full place outside of the author's head. The trouble is, if you're if you're the one making the world, like I said, it can be this big intimidating thing. You look at somebody like Tolkien with his lists and lists and lists and dates and battles and family trees for every character that ever breathed, every single hobbit that is ever mentioned in passing, and you're, you're just like, how? How do I do something that measures up to this? The answer is, you don't. <laughs> Not at first. Tolkien didn't start building Middle-earth with a giant timeline of everything that ever happened, or the Hobbit family trees, or even with a map, really. If you go back and look at the Book of Lost Tales, the original manuscripts for what would become the Silmarillion, it's a whole lot different. It's a series of elves telling a human protagonist short stories from their mythology. You you can see what would become the, the Silmarillion, the music of the Aenor, all that stuff taking shape, but it's still really, really different from how things ended up. Tolkien started with two things that he loved. He started with languages, which he'd studied for his entire adult life, and with uh, an idea that interested him, giving England its own mythology like the Norse myths, Norse myths he loved. And he, he built up the rest of it over his entire life. If you work on building one setting, one world, for your entire adult life, you will eventually get all those notes just to keep things consistent. But you really don't have to start there unless you're the kind of person who wants to. So then the question becomes, where do you start? Full disclosure, I'm a Dungeons & Dragons nerd. I got this piece of world building advice from the 3rd edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Because I am that kind of dweeb. Um, they, they say there's two ways you can build a campaign world for your Dungeons & Dragons game. And I've, I've found this advice works better, th not better, it works just as well for traditional writing, like, like novels or comics or whatever. The first way they, they say you can work is, oh, on my slides I got it written backwards, um, from how I normally discuss it. Okay, I'll run with it. Um, outside in or forwards we, we got to switch these bad boys around um outside in is you start with the big picture what you normally think of when you think of world building you draw a map you make a list of gods you figure out the climate and all the species and all the things that happened in the distant past that shaped how things are and it's a totally valid way to world build if that's what your your how your brain works it means you have more consistency from the beginning. You're, you're not, you know, I just had a mind blank. If, if you have, if you build outside in or what I call forwards, you, you've got more consistency. You're, you're less likely to get distracted by some shiny new idea and run with it and then realize a hundred pages later that you've just contradicted everything that you said in the first 20 pages. You're also better able to ask big questions about your world and your, like, like, how do the gods and men interact? It's easier to write that kind of thing if you're starting from there. The trouble is, 
I can't do that personally. I get overwhelmed somehow where around the, oh god, I have to make how many years of history happen stage, and then I wind up dropping the project entirely. Which, you know, if you're writing for fun, that's totally cool. If you're trying to write for a living, maybe not so much. So the dungeons, the Dungeon Master's Guide offers another way to build worlds. They call it inside out. I call it building worlds backwards. Title drop. You start from what you need for your story, for your game, and then you work from there. If you're running a Dungeons & Dragons campaign, that means going, well, I have a fighter, a wizard, a cleric, and a rogue in the party. This means that I need a god for the cleric, a place for these people to have come from, a town for them to start in, and a dungeon to explore. You figure things out from what you need for your story. As your party in the game levels up, they beat the dungeon you started with, they discover more things about who their characters are, and you build more world around them so that they have what they need at any given time. Th this advice is tailored for a Dungeons & Dragons game, which is collaborative writing. But if you're the kind of writer who has a lot of eureka moments while you write, if your characters tell you things about their lives, and you make connections about your world as you go, and you're like, oh, so that's why that works. I found I'm that kind of writer, and I found it works better for me than the names and dates and lists style of world building. So, the, the, the cons of this style, um, it's harder to keep consistency, you need to check back and keep notes as you're going to make sure you don't forget things. The pros are, it works, like I said, it works better for collaborative writing or eureka moments or characters that really stick out, and it lets you start right away. So this is the style of world building that I use most, and it's the one I'm going to be obviously talking about today. So... How, are, how can we apply this principle to more traditional writing? The first thing, you can relax. You don't have to have everything figured out to start telling your story. You can figure things out as you go. This adorable pug will guide you. Actually, I think that's a bulldog. So if you're the kind of writer who tends to start with characters, if you, if you get a person in your head and you're like, okay, I need to tell your story, you can use the character's personality and backstory and traits to world build. Say you've got a character who's a wizard. She dresses like a storybook witch with a pointy hat. She has a magic sword infused with star metal, and she has burn scars all up and down her right side because of a spell that went wrong. That tells you a surprising amount of, about your world right there, and you can start with any part of that description to get some world building details. Spells can go wrong in your world. Why? What makes a spell go wrong? Does magic go out of control if you stop concentrating on it, or if you mess up a ritual circle? Does magic go wrong if you don't speak to it politely enough? Are there safeguards to keep spells from going wrong? What if the reason wizards wear pointy hats and flowing robes is to conduct ma magical energy so they don't get magic on their skin? Do all kinds of magic burn on contact, or is it just fire magic, or what? So let's jump to the, one of the other parts of that character description. How do wizards normally study? Do they normally have a master-apprentice relationship, or do they normally study some other way? Does your world see wizards as tradesmen? Are they people who do a craft? Do wizards have customers? Do wizards advise kings? You get to decide. It's all up to you. But starting from that character, you get a whole bunch of detail that you might not ever have um, thought about if you started with the battles and dates and kings kind of world building. So let's do a quick exercise now. Um, it's time to write. Think of a character of yours, any character from any setting, and write down one thing that you know about them, any, anything that you like. Then take that one fact and extrapolate. Think of a couple other things that have to be true based on what you know about them. We can do that for five, ten minutes, and then anybody who wants to can share with the rest of the workshop. Sound good? And time. Okay. Who wants to go first? Anybody? Go for it. Alright, so, um, my character, I think the first thing is that she only wants to be a writer, and in this world that is, like, a magical navy kind of thing with, uh, like, Pegasus and unicorns and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so after that, it's, uh, she wants to follow in her dead parents' footsteps, 
She believes that she is special, uh, she's physically fit, and she knows a lot about equine and some equine going on. Awesome. Anybody else want to have a go? I'll go. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay. So I wrote, Gordon loves stuffed animals. Aww. Um, <laughs> so he owns a toy store and he rescues toys from the trash, fixes them up and sells them. When he sees kids misbehaving and being ungrateful to their parents, he decides to start putting spells in the toys so the toy takes on the characteristics of the child. Oh boy. That that sounds like a setup all right. <laughs> that was from the first line. Gordon loves stuff animals. Gordon loves stuff animals. That's cool. Okay. Um, so, how does stuffed animal magic work in your world, then? How does he put the characteristics of the, that's something worth figuring out. Yeah. You can, you can, yeah. you can figure it out. <laughs> yep. Now that you know what he does, you can sit down and figure out how it works. Mm -hmm. We got time for one more person. Anybody? Bueller? Go for sure. it. Sure. Um, sure, so, um, sure. So, did somebody else want to go? Did somebody else want to go? Um, um, so I've got a character got that, a character um, that I worked with for a short story that is going to need some more fleshing out. Um, her name is Agatha, and she's basically been sort of a sort of a maid to this um, uh, sort of heiress Henley uh, for a long time. So Henley basically elopes and brings Agatha with her, and um, I was and I basically needed a better reason for why Henley would bring Agatha. Um, so therefore they have a relationship, what's the power? Um, so Agatha has made Henley think that she needs her. Um, and that would mean that the world of the elite on this world um, um, is kind of making their servants sort of fight for power would be part of Agatha's backstory. Um, so that when Henley was, so that uh, when Agatha came to serve Henley, she um, basically needed to keep the job at all costs and spent years making Henley believe that she needed Agatha with her. Um, so the, the character is taking a darker turn than I thought. Um, but it's fleshing out, it's fleshing out the world that would make Agatha be the way that she That is brilliant. I love that so much, and it's, um, oh, am I echoing for anybody else? I, sorry. That, that is really brilliant. That is a perfect example of how the world shapes the character and the character shapes the world. I, I really love that. Speaking of shaping, um, we're going to move on a little bit now. Sorry, I, I just realized we're about halfway through our time. Um, there's another kind of backwards world building you can do, and that's from setting. There's two kinds of setting-related world building you can do. Drawing from realism and drawing from cool stuff. Capital cool. Let's give both a minute, and then we can do another quick exercise. Now, with realism, your world doesn't have to be realistic. And I'll, I'll go into that later, but in a realistic world, everything people make exists for a reason, no matter how stupid it might seem. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Have you ever seen a movie where somebody died from taking an arrow through a suit of plate armor? That doesn't work in real life. Plate armor was designed to keep arrows out. Arrows easily get through chain mail and other kinds of armor with lots of gaps. Plate mail is a direct response to that. And then pikes and gunpowder were a direct response to plate mail, and so on and so on and so on and so on. And then uh, another example is from fashion history, which is something I'm kind of a little bit of a geek about. People don't just wear things randomly. They don't wake up and decide, okay, I'm going to wrap a towel around myself and call it fashion. The clothes people wear are based on what kind of cloth they can make, what kind of sewing techniques they have, how long it takes to weave and sew and spin. There's there's a reason a lot of clothing in the ancient world was very sheet-like and drapey. It, it takes forever to make cloth with ancient techniques, and they didn't have a lot of the sewing techniques we have now that let 
like making pants be easy. As people made cloth faster, learned to sew easier, traded ideas, people made clothes that were warmer and softer and easier to, you know, be active in, and they kept ideas that worked and scrapped ones that didn't. So if you have something that's important to your setting, and you're trying to make a setting that's realistic and very grounded, that means that you've got a lot of little things going along with it, stuff that you might not have thought about. If you've got armor, you've got the forging techniques you need to make that armor. You've got reasons people would invent that kind of armor. You've got, you probably don't have things like gunpowder, or if you do, there's a reason that they're still using armor when gunpowder exists. There's a whole bunch of tech that goes along with every piece of society, no matter how small it is, whether it's the plumbing, the war machines, the farming, everything tells you something about your setting. That's what a settings quote unquote tech level is. It's an abstract way of talking about that different web of materials. If you're making a realistic setting, you kind of need to keep this in mind. What do the technologies that you're putting in the foreground depend on? If you've got Pegasuses, how do your knights feed them? How do they get the supplies that the Pegasuses need from point A to point B? And I'm going to make a recommendation here that isn't in my notes. If you're interested in that kind of thing, check out a blog called ACOUP. I think it's ACOUP.net, a collection of unmitigated ped pedantry. It's a military historian. Um, doing analyses of battles from like Game of Thrones and the Lord of the Rings movies and talking about the logistics and the, you know, it, it's really cool. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. I'm getting real sidetracked here. The answer to any of the logistics questions I just mentioned can be a whole plot in itself. They all tell you things about the world and working them out can answer a lot of questions about the power dynamics and the, the infrastructure of your society and all that stuff. But, big but. Not every setting needs to be realistic. If you're making a world that's got World of Warcraft vibes, it's totally okay to have giant steampunk mecha that exists completely disconnected from the rest of the setting. It's okay to have knights with massive, massive shoulder pads that would never, ever, ever... That, that, I mean, look at those things. They're bigger than her head and they're on fire. It's okay to hand wave over things like, how does the floating city get food? That's not the point of your setting here. The point is to make something cool, and if you're stylizing it on purpose, if it's not supposed to be realistic, if it's supposed to be cool, run with it. Um, an author I like called Stephen Brust is talking about something he calls the cool stuff theory of literature, which boils down to fantasy literature exists as a way of getting as much stuff that you, the writer, think is cool into one place. Think that giant swords and barbarians and hewing of limbs is cool? Write about that. Think cloaks and daggers and politics and midnight stabbings are cool? Write about that. Think that mutant super soldiers, angsty backstories, and tragic forbidden love are cool? Y you get the idea. So if you're writing in a more stylized, less realistic way, one way to get some world building is just to go all the way to the wall with your cool stuff. What's something that you think is cool that you don't have in your setting yet, and how can you get it there? Here's an example from my own writing. I absolutely love autistic characters, shapeshifters, and eldritch horrors. Any setting that I make is probably going to have all three in it somewhere because I'm me. Um, I'm working on a fantasy, I'm world building a fantasy setting for my Patreon patrons called Valrockthir. It's definitely a cool stuff, stylized kind of fantasy setting. It draws a lot from like 80s romantic fantasy, 80s, 90s cult movies, think the Dark Crystal, Willow, stuff like that. In Valrockthir, there are eldritch abominations. There are gribbly monsters called the Eight Kith, Eighth Kith, living in the big network of caves under the world. In Valrockthir, just about anything that isn't a human can shapeshift. Elves can turn into beings of pure light. The gem people called facets can mold their bodies into rock. The beastborn are basically were critters. Sirens can turn into an entire flock of birds, and gnomes can shapeshift into one thing based on their special interest. And yeah, in Val Valrockthir, all gnomes are autistic by default. They have trouble with eye contact and social skills, they're blunt and say what they mean, and their entire lives are defined by a special interest that they love with the pa burning passion of a million suns. Or a World of Warcraft character's shoulder pad. They're one of my favorite parts of the setting, and writing them is always a delight. So, it's time for exercise number two. Well, wait. 
just just quick thing I forgot to say. Um, so when you're writing something that's stylized, or even when you're writing something realistic, sit down and think about the cool things that make you happy to write. What sparks joy for you? Can you figure out how to work it in? So now it's time for exercise number two. Whoop. Take 10 minutes. Think about one realistic detail of your world that you're interested in working out and one cool thing that you're really interested in working in. Jot down some notes about it and we can read them if you want. Go for it. You're very brave. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and then the cool thing is the whole reason I decided to do this story was because my previous one had a lot of things in it that I was like, why did I even decide to write a story about this? I don't even like birds. But I love horses, and that's why I'm doing this one. Horses are awesome. <laughs> Anybody else? Cool. Um, I was I was realizing that this particular world, although it, although it was cool because it was um, spaceships, um, the the cool part for me is finding the coolness in the realism. Um, I started out with from the idea of basically that there's a, you know hierarchy, social strata, um, and then relationships both inform and then also mitigate where you're standing in the hierarchy. Um, so Agatha is kind of low in social standing, and, but she has power because she's manipulating Henley, who is of higher standing. Um, and then, because they're, the whole thing, the whole point of the story is travel, travel is one of the ways to actually completely break out of those. And there is social mobility, but you really start from the bottom. You go wherever you are, and whatever you have, you have to start building up your level of power. So, it was interesting getting to see that travel is going to be a complete disruptive factor. Um, so spaceships, the coolness actually starts to become very realistic because once you get to you know the outer rim where you have to work with your hands for a living and start from the bottom, you, you do actually get to eventually move up, hopefully. So we'll see how that goes. That's super cool. Oh my goodness. I want to read the story now, just so you know. Anybody else want to have a go? We got time for like one more. Uh, I can go. Go for it. Okay. Uh, the realistic detail is that the fashion of Metropolis is dictated by the work that you do. White collar work means you're more likely to have purely functional clothing. Blue collar will be upscale but breathable. So if you're in an office for someone rich, you wear something that looks nice enough. Uh, most of the wealthy of the megacity wear ever-changing, generally non-functional clothing. That's more statement pieces akin to the Met Gala. Oh my goodness. That is awesome. Uh, the cool thing? I don't yeah. know how cool this actually is, because it's kind of terrible. Uh, the social strata of Metropolis and thus your job, and thus by extension, the city that's underneath of the city, are all determined wholly by rumors and gossip that are wielded as social currency. In order to improve your station in life, you have to social climb. In order to social climb, you have to control what's being said about you. And in order to control what's being said about you, you have to hire shushmersh, a private investigator specializing in digging up rumors and covering up secrets. Rumors, the best rumors, are broadcast three times daily over all media channels. Oh my goodness. A, cool is whatever you select, but B, that is really cool. Oh my goodness. I love that idea of a of a most people having to have a PI whose job is just to cover up the crap that people are saying about them. That that is an incredible source of story ideas. They write themselves. All right. So we got to finish up real quick so that we got time for questions and things if anybody has any. Um, so 
why we world build in the first place. You can make a fake world just as its own kind of art. You don't have to do it in the service of anything. If, if you just want to sit down and build out a world that, that is just for your own aesthetic enjoyment, more power to you. But most of the time, if you're, if you're world building, it's in the service of a story you're trying to tell. An, a novel, a movie, a game, uh, an ARG, whatever you're doing. If It can get really easy to lose track of that, to get lost in the weeds and start getting bogged down in things that don't really matter. Like, a lot of people will get upset if you don't have, give at least the sense that your characters are getting food from somewhere, that it's not magically appearing. But at the same time, nobody wants to read a 75-page treatise on how farming works in your fantasy world. Unless they're fans of Les Mis, but we're masochists over here. Um, it can get really easy to get bogged down like that. It can also get easy to bog down and shut out your readers. Your, your fans love to explore. They love to find answers to big questions and little ones. To unravel any contradictions and find meaning in even the tiniest details. You, you've got people analyzing the blue milk in Star Wars for pity's sake. If you solve every mystery in your world, answer every question, there's no room for your reader to play. When you build your world backwards, you're building the world to serve the story you're telling, not the other way around. Ultimately, that means you're building the world to serve your readers, and in the context of writing commercial fiction, that's a really good thing. we got a little time left for questions. Anybody have any? I don't at the moment, but I'm planning to turn this um, presentation into a book. So that is something excellent that I could include. Thank you for asking. I think one thing that um, you could absolutely do when you're world building backwards is think about how your character got into the situation that they're in and what you need to put in to support that situation. If you've got a lot of elites, they still need people to feed and clothe and, you know, care for them. And it, it, you've got a good handle on that, obviously. Anybody else? So it looks like there's the two extremes with the rule of school and then, like, expansive uh, world background and world building. Figure out how to put this, but like, figure out how to put this, will, like, I guess, will some people be? I guess, will some people be? Is that happy medium unsatisfying happy medium because unsatisfying it's not one or the other? Is basically my question. Oh, heck no. Every writer does both to some degree. Like, yeah. Game of Thrones, to take an example, the, I guess I should say A Song of Ice and Fire, what, whatever we're calling the book version of that now. George R. R. Martin has a huge thing for the Tudor era and the Wars of the Roses. He thinks it's super cool. Even though he's trying to write a more grounded setting, he keeps coming back to that because it's something he thinks is awesome. And then on the flip side of that, um, to take something like Harry Potter, which is a very stylized kind of setting, you know, the, we don't know how any of the magic works. It just does. Even though they're going to school to learn how magic works. Interesting. But she still has things like, how do wizards govern themselves? How do wizards clean their houses? How do wizards, you know, can magic make food? So, so You can't have both in one story. You can. And that's totally normal. I, I phrased it as two extremes because it's easy to see with the more extreme examples, the principles, but absolutely, you can do both and you will be happier for it. Thanks. Welcome.
Excuse me for just a second. A for oh, you. go for it. Enjoy world building, and it's one of my favorite things to do with my stories. But I have the bad habit of coming up with something new right in the middle of my novel. Oh, or, you know, in that second draft, when technically I'm not supposed to be adding any new cool elements or new interesting world building. I, what do I do with that? You know, do do I move forward and make changes to my stories, or should I set that aside for something else? Especially when I have other stories I'm writing in this world. Oh, criminy! I have that problem too with a burning. It it is the curse of the writer. So, one piece of advice I've heard that does help somewhat. I don't take my own advice all the time. So, barrel of salt. One thing that I've heard that is really good advice is that you write it down in a separate document, you save that document, if you keep thinking about it, and you can't get it off your mind, and you know it needs to be there, go ahead and edit it and put it in. If it's just a plot bunny, the darn things multiply, you can save it for another project and it won't kill you. But if, if it needs to be there, you will know. You, you will not be able to stop thinking about it and ruminating on it and going, this would work really well with the cool thing here. Hey, thanks. Welcome. Hey, thanks. Okay. Um, so... If you liked my presentation and want to hear more, you can find me other places on the internet, like at Twitter, I'm at Malcolm Schmitz. On Tumblr, I'm MalcolmSchmitz.tumblr.com. And I wouldn't normally do this because it, it smacks of shilling, but I have a Patreon page at Malcolm Schmitz, and the reason I'm bringing it up is that on that page, I am world building uh, the fantasy setting I mentioned from scratch. I'm starting with the fantasy races and working out from there. I'm calling them kiths because calling fantasy species races just kind of sits weird on the tongue. Um, so if you're interested and want to see something like that happen, you know, slowly, week by week, you can become my Patreon patron and for the price of a bar of ivory soap... Yeah. Shameless self-promotion over. I think we've got time for one or two more questions. I don't see a facilitator in here, but um, yeah, we're supposed to go right to the 10 minute mark. So hope you guys enjoyed. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thanks. Especially thank you thanks you, thanks. thank you for Especially being so flexible. Thank hey, you. it's no problem. I I know events like these are always. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. You've you've been a great audience. I loved your ideas. I'd love to hear more of your stories. This is fantastic and inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just let me know when you need me to clear out the room. Uh, yeah, you go ahead and uh, yeah, you go ahead and um, we might. Go back to Zoom after this anyway. All right, cool. Thank you. I'm actually. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. I'm glad you let me use a platform I'm more comfortable with, honestly. So it all works out for everybody. <laughs> awesome. Take care of yourselves. Bye.